least at that time, that that meant that I was going to leave nothing behind, that my legacy is going to be making the air molecules move a little bit, <laughs> and then they'll go on moving and it will all just dissipate into nothing. But uh, I didn't reckon on video, and so the exhibition is mainly a video record of some of my work, and uh, um, through Romain and Joao, uh, kind of a, um, some words about it, and things that I wrote down at some point in my life. I didn't have to do anything, and uh, then I had to come because otherwise I, I would be letting down, you know, the site. But that's that's why I'm here. I'm here to support their work, and I'm, I haven't seen their work yet. I'm interested to see the exhibition, as uh, you know, actually more interested than some, I'm sure. See what they made of me, <laughs> but knowing full well that uh, the feeling of living a life and the representation are two different things, and so uh, I'm not going to be, you know, expecting too much. I'm not going to expect everything I remember, for instance, <laughs> everything I that happened to me. When you it's get impossible. older, you you think a lot about the consequences of different moments, and um, <coughs> like the moment uh, uh, I write about in here, uh, moments that happened when I was about five or six years old. You know, barely conscious, not aware that I had any great responsibility, or you know, not even really in school yet. And and you notice that that uh, first tries sometimes you kept trying you kept working. So I talk about cartwheels here. Cartwheel is a simple you know thing of going over. Yeah. Today someone was asking, "What is a cartwheel?" What is someone a cartwheel? Someone was yeah. reading Gravity. And what what is uh, what is a cartwheel? cartwheel. I don't know what you call them here. Choda. Roda also means round, you know, mm -hmm. uh, around. Roda. Wheel. 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 For instance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a And, um... Ah, well... Getting hot. Yeah, I know the experience of the cart wheel. I never thought it was wheel and cart. I think it's about the legs and arms being the spokes. Like a star. So this is, yeah, like a star, and that's what a wheel, yeah. wooden wheels had that. Okay. This it's, yeah, yeah. Had, yeah. But anyway, that feeling, that learning, the fact that I was aware that I had to learn it, I couldn't do it at first, of course, and then I learned how to do it, and then it felt great. And then it became normal, uh, and for the rest of my life I could do it. That that started something, and I think with that followed eventually gymnastics, and followed dance, and then followed trying to figure out what dance was. You know, like it is something. It means something. It's I also came, nice to have, like, when you put side by side um, documentation of moments mm. that you perhaps when they breathe together they tell you other stories of, about the in-between moments Maybe. that you perhaps yeah, yeah, yeah. Or make I you like question. to do that with, yeah. with books for instance mm. if you put books like this it's not the same as if you put like that mm. and when you see these materials together they kind of whoop, yeah. wobble and yeah. tell you other things Anyway, that's. I don't expect my first cartwheel to be in this exhibition. <laughs> There's no way. There's so many things about the body and about being human that they can't document. You know, so much about your lives that are just 
known to you, and eventually you will think back that was a turning point, you know. But um, one of the other things, we have a friend, uh, a guy in Paris, who's a neuro, what, scientist? Neuro something? <laughs> Neurocognitive scientist. Neurocognitive scientist. Anyway, he's he's interested in contact improvisation and dancing. He has gotten more interested in it the last few years. And I look at his work. I look at who what he really does, which is to try to figure out the molecular structure of the brain. I guess something like that. He's working in the brain at molecular levels. Uh, looking at um, the way neurons fire and uh, sites of activity and very, you know when they measure things, and he, the poor guy has become interested in dance, but he can't measure dance in that way <laughs> because while you're dancing, you can't be measured because the machines don't work that well yet. I'm sure it will come. I'm sure they'll get to be more portable, but right now they're I not portable. I think it's portable. impossible to measure. It will come. No, it will not. It will. Here you have the two sides. You. It's impossible. Well, so far it's impossible. Machines are always redu reducting things. And They're just machines, Sophia. Yeah, that's why it's, it's impossible. So, so it's, it's, it's us, it's the humans that are running and making them. Yeah. Don't you have any... I, can, I study neuroscience the most twice a year. Because, you know, I go there, I dive, and I say, where are they now? And I go, like, <laughs> and go back again. Uh, it's really impossible. One of the biggest neuroscientists the other day was saying, in the world, like acknowledged, was saying, we will never know behavior unless we control it. And I go, like, <laughs> there we go again. It's everything about control and measuring, but measuring in this sense of uh, already given uh, measuring uh, dispositive, dispositive, message, dispositive. Mm. Device. device. Already existing device. Like we totally forgot the metro, the Dusha metro question. What is a metro? What is a device? What is this thing of the device? Well, Anybody disagree? Who's <laughs> <laughs> <Close> with me? <laughs> no, so th that's what our friend is up against, you know, that he's, he's interested, he sees the potential, he sees, he intuits what's happening, but he can't do it scientifically yet. He can't, <laughs> he can't get his machines, he can't get his measuring. Uh, he, he can find ways I guess, like I did, you know, to kind of uh, look at um, uh, events. Um, what, in terms of asking people what they feel? In terms of, you know, that's that's his science so far, isn't it? Would you say? Or do you have more to say to add? One of the things that Asaf says and that we use in the laboratory is the idea that usually cognitive science is made on dancers, rarely with them, in the sense of uh, trying to uh, teach the machines to perceive what dancers have the ability to perceive in an instant, or their tendency to notice you know, collective decisions or ways of uh, having the go. You know, sometimes you have that moment where Certainly, your collective can do something. You don't exactly know why, but if you see it, to recognize mathematically what intuitively or below discourse or below cortical level dancers do. I feel some, and he often says, you know, Steve is the scientist, and I'm only, you know, doing the analysis. Is as a neuroscientist. Uh, in that way, I feel that your job has to do with a sort of a strange experimental science of movement, uh, an obsession with you know, putting consciousness where it wasn't, which is really what science is about in the first place. 
placing consciousness where it doesn't belong. How did I find those places? If the, if this theory is true, <laughs> am I to answer this? How, yes. How 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 does one find where consciousness isn't? I love that question. Mm. But what is consciousness? That's not the question. <laughs> how does one find where? What consciousness is consciousness? Is the con- is the person asking that question? Is is. <laughs> As the consciousness. <laughs> no, but... Well, it seems you had one method with contact improvisation, which was to trick yourself into behaving reflexively. Allow might be a better choice of words. Trick. Is there a trick? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, normally in society, look what we're doing right now. You don't need your reflexes much. You know, you're you're calm, you're passive, you're isolated. You know, I don't know. I, it looks like people are not threatened in any way right now. So not much need for the movement reflexes up. Oh. There's a, there's a reflex. There's a disagree. So we can digest, okay. Can you say again, science is a, a way to put attention where it is not nothing. Consciousness. To put consciousness where it isn't. Conscious word. I don't know what it is. You can't spell it. Conscious. I can trick myself and trick yourself into spelling it. <laughs> no, it's um, um, but it isn't attention. It's it should be more than attention. Like cats have attention. So it's a return of the attention. But the weakness. I don't know. It's being aware that the you're weakness. attending. Hmm? The witness situation. The witness situation. Yeah. Well, being aware that you're witnessing. Exactly. It's something. It's something. Coming something like that. Like I, the watcher, I don't want to have this conversation control. because Not being, you know, I know it's a loser to be. Yeah. <laughs> I think here is like the, the turn of like the sensing with you instead of like. Growing, planning, and, and waiting what's there to do the dance. Instead of plan, and even, even when you plan the dance, okay, I'm going, whatever. Mm. And, and really be true to that, okay, I'm going with what, what I sense. And that is the learning. No? Mm. And we always put the other thing, so it's never nothing, no, it's nothing really. Or it's many things, it's not really. And of course, you cannot isolate and all that because all is involved. But what is the focus? No? And I think there was a different. And I think the, to the Grand Union, right? For me, the Grand Union, which I, I think that's what we know less about because it was like more informal group or something. Mm, and, mm, mm, mm. and But what I learned is like you make it as you go along to the, all these different choreographers already working together, which is so hard <laughs> to get <laughs> work to, that, to be done like this. No? And I, I, mm. you wanna, I know there's probably one, one room, right, Roma? There's one room for them. It's called a study in anarchy. Yeah. Uh, That's nice. Which yeah. <laughs> somehow I feel is some, one of the tools that you use to explore. I, I'm, I feel very positive about anarchy. <laughs> I, I have a strong feeling for it. Because, Why? well, because it's the opposite of conformity. It's hope, anarchy. Yeah, anarchy has hope, Don't where we? conformity is, is like uh, uh, living your life with no uh, uh, I don't know, chance to have your own adventure or something. It's 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 living somebody else's idea of a life, perhaps to conform, to form yourself according to the ideas that are 
imposed on every culture. And it just seems to me like everybody resists this conformity. I don't know anybody who says, yes, I only do what I'm told and I, I live my life, you know, according to the rules and religion and government and taxes and, you know, military and, you know, everybody resists that idea to some degree. And yet, how far can you resist? And that's where I think the improvisation comes in, you know, how to, how to resist without, um, uh, how, how, how to employ anarchy or, or enjoy anarchy without breaking things. I think, it, I think it's really important that my life not hurt somebody else's life. And often in conformity, I mean, one reason I resist conforming is because I feel like in conformity I'm complicit in the general hurting of people. Right? General. Like I'm an, I'm an Amer hurting people. I'm an American, so... I have now this president who's taking children away from their family at the border. So I can't conform. And he's an extreme example. We all know it's it's crazy over there and he's an extreme example, but and and it will change, but um the thing is, it isn't the only kind of thing that happens. I mean, in, in my life, we've, we've had a number of wars, and some of them really were unnecessary. And millions of people have, you know, that's to some degree, by being a citizen of that country, I'm conforming with those facts. I think that gives me a lot of right to unconform, you know, especially in the ways that as artists we always do. I'm not going to, uh, I mean, it's not important how you dress or, you know, where you live or things like that. But what's important is will your brain be liberated to be creative. If your brain is always racing to conform, because conforming is not easy, you know, any life is not easy. But if your brain doesn't have a chance to find its brilliance, to find its, find some, mm, uh, possibility in life that only you are the key for, Really? Well, I can ask you something. Like when you say brain, other perspectives use heart. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's what it's been for me. It's, uh, mm. Boink, 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 boink. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say I say brain because we were talking consciousness. And in fact, haven't they discovered that the heart contains a lot of uh, neurons? Yeah. Yeah. So it has a kind of little brain thing going all on its own. Mm -hmm. Also the intestine. Mm -hmm. Also the intestine. And the intestines. Yeah. Has neurons? <laughs> a big boost for gastronomy. <laughs> I don't know about neurons, but consciousness, at least from my experience, you know, what I experience, is all over the body. So, well, I, the, the, yeah, I, I was, I, I slipped. I said I didn't want to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a trap. Yes, my, one of my biggest moments was when I stopped, uh, 
when I stopped thinking about my different parts and thought, really, the brain focuses, this is the brain again, the brain focuses, I can only perceive through the brain in a way, you know, I'm, I'm only aware of what's, what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling through what the brain tells me it is, because it's the kind of computer collector event that's happening in the body. And I thought, if it focuses, that means that it's trying to cess out one thing. If I trick my brain by thinking of my body as one thing, then it will focus on that. And I think that was a big moment in my dancing. And I also think it was a big moment for my audience. Because I think at that moment I started emitting something differently than I had done before when I was thinking of myself as a collection of torso, limbs, you know, activities. It's not, somehow I think something unified. Sorry, it reminds me of the Mazu. Because this, this guy is a neuro, neuro, a cognitive scientist, Portuguese, and he was one of the persons that uh, helped understand why we cannot have it in, um, awareness and conscious, logical uh, awareness without emotions. Mm. You know, because there was an accident, and a guy was like, there was a metal scene coming on his head or something, and he survived, but that part of the brain linked with emotions was gone, and he had the, all the cortex was fine, and he was not able to not make a word, but make sense. So that's why, you know, brain and, and heart and... and yeah, but they always give that example of the guy that's okay. the... But the <laughs> and uh, I see uh, well, that happened to him. I don't know if it would, would happen. I mean, it's just people didn't know yet. You know, yeah, some yeah. people didn't know. And I think it's an important because it was one of the, the, the contributions to understand that really emotions are related to cognition. And without it, we cannot reason. Also, also motion, you know? also pushing, grabbing. So I just think that when we start, he doesn't want to have this conversation. <laughs> I don't want to have the conversation about consciousness, but now that we're in it, we've been in it for minutes now. <laughs> I, um, we don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. They don't know how to find it. They don't know where it is. I think dancers have a real place at that table mm -hmm. because we're dealing, we can't help but deal with the full package of a human being. And so if you are doing that, what are your questions about this unit of, of life that you are? And so I think intelligence, consciousness and intelligence are linked. Uh, I think. Conscious, consciousness, it just means being aware, doesn't it? So um, um, it's your link with the outside and it's also your link with yourself. The brain doesn't have, it is informed by the senses, by the movement, by the touch, by the smell, by the vision, by the hearing. It's a, a whole blend of stuff that's happening to blend into this event. You wait on the floor, your, your, your feeling for the apple cake, your, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all in your consciousness at once. Yeah, so but I was it's, thinking, it's, this thing of the yeah. senses. Yeah. I was thinking this thing of the senses. Oh, the senses, yes. Uh, because whenever we go into neurosciences or whatever, or talking about the brain, the, the smell of the room starts to be a little bit more electric than it was before. <laughs> so I guess like I want to you know, just let something else come because we are not strictly electric. <laughs> and I'm very happy about it. Uh, and for instance, one thing I've been discovering, this is, this is not a scientific discovery. Uh, 
but it's like studying, for instance, the fascias, you know, like the, but studying dancing and then and then meeting people that study the fascias more scientifically and, and moving through with this kind of discoveries. Like the um, one thing that is very uh, mysterious, which for me is always nice, uh, is that uh, they found out recently, like three years ago, that uh, superficial fascias have much more um, sensors than the deep fascias. And I was thinking, thinking dancing, that perhaps this uh, becoming a body, the body, the human body, um, is always pulsing and doesn't need so much specialization in its core. It's much more of a ever beginning unit that as it uh, touches the world, it gets more. Because before they thought that they had to go very deep in the geography of the body to find the deep senses of the fascists, but there, there are no Finding uh, like specialist senses. The sensing of the fascia in the in interior, like this thing, the interior, I don't know what's mm. the interior of the body because it's always coming inside mm. out, outside in, but the, there is a heart, a heart or a, 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 an inner pulse that is always uh, becoming and sensing, I guess, and thinking and and dancing uh, with no uh, specialist specialist devices for that. This is a this is a. I you think, mean, no organ that makes it happen. No specific device for that. What's a device? In this? I don't know. A dispositivo. No, <laughs> It's a thing, a thing, a, a, a thing. No specific thing. No, like Makes the, the whole the whole body sees, but you have the specific eyes for vision. Yeah. Right. The whole body smells, but you have. Uh, and and these things of the specialization of the landscapes of the body, if we can see them as, as something that, just thinking, as something that uh, continually continuously. Uh, vibrates from the core of nothingness into the specialization of the different diversity of things you meet and you relate to. Uh, instead of, you know, cutting the body into pieces Frankenstein-wise and mm. trying to see spits for this and for that. <coughs> I think it's really the way we think body that the dancers could mm. Mm. shake a little bit mm. if they don't get to nosy if they get this they continue with the simplicity of being earth body mm. you know not knowing I mean, the only thing is how, how do we find the questions they are they are being so simple I could always. have danced my entire life in the Cunningham company doing what somebody else told me to do, I would have been really happy. I think, yeah. I doubt it. What made you stupid? <laughs> <laughs> Will you stop doubting? No, actually, da you're doubting my life? Yes. You're doubting my alternate reality? I don't know it's, it's, it's where terrible. we're going with this It's a song, it's a song. Doubt. It's an actual curiosity, and I don't have the answer. What is I'm supposed to be the vice. You're, so, you're the authority. <laughs> but I don't know why Who's you the fit the company. The Cunningham Company in 64, I guess. But I know. <laughs> you know, I fell, I fell in love with legs and extending, and the whole, the whole critical um, invention that ballet manifests is is projection, you know, projecting the feet and the legs out, you know, to the extreme, the arms and the spine out to the extreme, and working in that state, and that isn't amazing, it doesn't exist in any other uh, movement that I've ever seen in the world, 
no place goes out there and stays out there. And um, and it, its premise is very clear. You know, it makes amazing things happen physically in the bodies. <coughs> if you're grown up with ballet technique, your body becomes slightly inhuman. If the rest of humanity is contracted and gravity oppressed, ballet is not. Ballet is expanded to the max, and ballet um, and gravity, what, um, playful. So, it's it's a success. Modern dance could not eliminate all traces of it. Uh, Cunningham was who admitted that he was interested, you know, and that it wasn't such a big scandal to include this principle, movement principle, really, in his work. His dancers were so beautiful, though. They were so clean, clear, simple. They were perfect for his work. His work was built on them, so it all worked together. Anyway, this is the company I fell in love with. How many were there? There were altogether uh, six people in the company, including okay. Cunningham. Okay, okay. Not too big a number to fall in love with, I think, <laughs> personally. Yeah. That's very different from the ballet. <clears throat> and so then came 1964 and the World Tour. And the World Tour was a six month tour of the world, starting off, you know, um, starting off actually in America, doing the work up to the touring, going to Europe, touring around all summer, uh, having an amazing time. And then we came to a crisis point. Uh, I still don't know what really happened. But um, I think it was a financial crisis that meant that the rest of the tour, which was going to be another tour through Europe, then India, Thailand, and Japan, was going to be canceled. And um, so there was disagreement whether we were in a financial crisis or not. One of the dynamics that had been happening that summer is that Robert Rauschenberg, the painter, who was our lighting man, you know, and a good friend of Cunningham's, was uh, had won the Venice Biennale and was the most popular artist in the world at that moment. I mean, in terms of, you know, pop news. So we came to London, for instance. He had just won the Biennale. Uh, the, the papers were only interested in, in Rauschenberg and not interested in Cunningham. <laughs> and it was the Cunningham Company, for Christ's sake. <laughs> so... So uh, yeah, you know, there there came there, there got to be some friction in terms of exactly whose company it was, you know, in a way whose whose company it was seen as. So that continued through Scandinavia, through <laughs> Eastern Europe, uh, uh, continued into into uh, India. Um, I guess once we got out of Europe, it wasn't such a big deal that Rauschenberg had won that prize. It was, for some reason, it was a phenomenal event. And I don't know, had, had Americans won the Biennale before? Maybe he was an early one. Maybe he was the first one in a long time. I don't know. I can't remember the history of that prize. but. Uh, at any rate, um, the, my feeling for the company changed through that tour because now the company was not a really cohesive unit. Now the company was falling apart in various ways. People weren't happy about different people's attitudes and actions. And so when I got to Japan, I just told Cunningham that I was going to leave the company. I had no further plans. I just knew that this was not the company that I... I also knew 
In London, that company got the best reviews I've ever seen for any, well, for the modern dancers anyway. They got page after page of newspaper reviews of just glowing, fantastic uh, reviews, you know. We were booked in one theater, uh, Sadler's Wells, I think we started in, and we then because of these reviews, we're encouraged to move to a new theater, and we started a new season at the Phoenix Theater, and we stayed in London for an extended period of time. A great success was, was had by all. <laughs> um, I don't know why I said that. Was the success the beginning of the ruin? I well, remember you saying, enjoying when Kate was driving the the van, and we were all packed for 15 yeah, hours, yeah. and actually enjoying it. We were nine people in a VW van, I enjoyed that period of the... <laughs> oh, that, that was it. Yeah, it's because of the transition that happened. Then what was going to be happening for that company from then on was that it wasn't going to be a, a band of, of uh, artists, you know, fighting against the society, you know, driving your VW van across Europe or across, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter where you're driving across, but you're driving slowly across some vast distance. Almost there. Almost there, yes. One more night at a motel, and then we'll, you know. Uh, and it was going to be taken over by giant tour buses and, and managers and... and uh, And I saw what happened after I left, you know, having sussed this out. I saw the company um, in 86. And I saw the dancers waiting to be told what to do by the manager, who was the same manager that we had had in the 64 tour. Same guy was still there managing the tour. <laughs> and. The dancers were infantilized. These were mature people. They were in their 30s. They were great dancers in every way. But they couldn't make certain decisions uh, on tour. They were, they were only to be managed. And I know that the guy that was managing them had that attitude toward dancers. They were the material. You know, they weren't the artists. I mean, some of them were, a few of them were, but by and large, as a, they were a problematic um, group of people who didn't have much responsibility, just, you know, get them on stage in costume and they'll do their thing and then get them off again and... Yeah, but it happens a lot. Yeah. That's It's the opening of the star business in contemporary yeah. dance. <coughs> And it meant that I would not be seeing Cunningham, you know. Uh, I, he, he might be rehearsing me. If I stayed in the company, he might be rehearsing me and building the new work. But um, basically all the... And also my responsibilities. I used to be the one who packed the bus. <laughs> you know, I put all of that, the VW bus, you know, we had the rack on top, uh, David Tudor, musical equipment, all the costumes, whatever sets we brought, uh, and our luggage, and then also our luggage in the back compartment, and then also our luggage underneath the seats. I mean, nine people in a bus <laughs> with all of that. Cage was a genius at keeping that machine running, mm -hmm. and it's and VW is to be commended mm -hmm. for making a machine that would run under those conditions. <laughs> we went up the Rocky Mountains, you know. We went up <laughs> 9,000 feet in the air yeah. in that bus and down the other side safely, you know. And it it was amazing. Anyway, we never it never failed us, and and. And in that life, I, that, I think I would have been happy to stay there. I don't think I would be happy to be in the more affluent cutting kind of company, though. Because it lost its, its homemade touch. 
in '64, you during the 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 event tour, mm -hmm. you met uh, during the world tour of the Com Cunningham Company. You met Aikido, is that yes. right? In yes. Tokyo. Yes. That also kind of inflicted the course well, of I your didn't, life in I a didn't very know, different. I didn't know that it did, but it did. Yeah. It's one of the things that you found afterwards. That was a turning point. What Aikido? Yeah. Well, I found it. I found it on that tour. Um, I got to see Osensei and at Hambu Dojo, and and take some. Uh, I think I took four, seven a.m. Um, Aikido <coughs> classes with this black belt guy, who was really pissed off. <laughs> that somebody had signed up for classes at 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> he really didn't. He didn't not really, fit. Yeah, he, and, and it was this white guy, and you know. Anyway, he, he treated me a little bit rudely, but I survived him, and I got, and I survived the experience, and got back to New York, and then I wasn't doing anything. I mean, I wasn't with the company anymore. And I really didn't know what I was going to be doing. I knew, I suspected I would make more work. But uh, I was... How did you dance? Hmm? How did you dance? Like every day? Or? No, I didn't. You didn't? You no, were I in a flat have, I didn't have day? a place. I didn't have, no, I was outside and, and, you know, you can go outside <laughs> even though you're not dancing. <laughs> But <laughs> <laughs> nice to know. No, I don't know. I might have been involved with Judson. I think when I 60, 64, I could probably dance in the Judson gym and with the Judson Dance Theater be doing events. I was probably making work. Um, but anyway, Aikido became... Now, the Aikido school allowed you to come as much as you wanted for $20 a month. And so they gave classes three times a day. And you could do them all. You could do them all. <laughs> and that's what I did. For a couple of years, I was there three times a day. And I think I was very depressed at that point. And I think the Aikido really helped me cope with that emotion. You know, just get me through it because... Uh, it's a huge change to live in a community and dance. Yeah, and yeah. When you were in, in the Cunningham company with him, did you find did you ever find like uh, important for you to find your place of um Retreat. <coughs> of something like retreat he says. Something of being with yourself uh, listening to the dance that was coming out of your... Boy, that is such a good description of what happened. Yeah, it is. It is? Yeah, it is. My part was. And um, I remember feeling myself only as uh, almost, almost empty. I was only lines and and movements and shapes and timing. Anyway, that's what I felt I had to be. That's what that's what my physical self was at that point in that dance. And it was spooky to be there. Yeah, but in the, the, the everyday practicing, the everyday training, that this really seems to be so Awkward. I, I can imagine is it a, as a, a concept. I can even imagine it as a desire for emptiness in the sense Cage also wanted it, you know. That. Mm -hmm. But uh, being a dancer, the training, everyday training, is demanding uh, and uh, it moves you through lots of different densities. It's impossible to be, you know, clean and uh, uh, unemotional. I don't mean expressing is something else. Expressing is something else. But, you know, the, f the physicality of being, the physicality of being, of being alive is already, is already a lot of work. 
And if you dance every day, and with the with the Cunningham, it was like so technically demanding for that precise gesture. Like you had to do it every day, otherwise it would not go this <coughs> plié, pirouette, whatever they were doing. It was like, what the fuck, this is not possible. They have to work a lot, the body. So I guess this is already emotion, the, the moving through this artisan uh, body work every day. I guess there's another level in the communication of it, in the performance of it. I mean, arguably, the most important thing about a class is doing the class. It doesn't much matter how you feel while you're doing it. But you do feel. Well, you do feel something, but you know, put that aside or, or let that be just an area that we're uh, saying could be anything. It doesn't much matter. I learned Aikido very well while depressed. You know, uh, I don't know if I could have learned Cunningham while depressed because there's so much. <coughs> anyway, Aikido got rid of my depression, I feel. And at a later stage, another depression, I think I got rid of with ballet. Because I don't think it's possible to be fully depressed while you're extending. While you're, <laughs> no. this, this is not an embraced posture. This is, this is a depressed posture. This is an undepressed posture. <laughs> So, um, so there's that. That I don't think it matters. I think as long as you're fulfilling the standards of the technique, to some degree, as long as you can do that, then it doesn't much matter what you think of it or how it feels. I mean, leaving room for everything, everybody in the class is feeling and thinking is a different thing. Obviously, what they have in common is the shapes and speeds and movement. Um, so, but uh, in performance, it's a, the chips are slightly raised because there's something that happens to you when you're in front of an audience that's. Uh, um, adrenalizing, I guess, you know, it brings you to a, a, a different level. And so then, to be in that heightened state and trying to stay empty and to just be the shape of what you are, a very interesting discipline. But anyway, this just goes into the mix of all these things that dancers have to play with. I mean, this mental event that I'm just talking about, that we're just arguing about, you know, mm -hmm. what, where, where are you at when you work? Mm -hmm. um, it's... Um, It's part of what you go through, part of what you question, part of what you discover, part of what becoming a dancer is. Cunningham used to say he would no more be late for class than he would be late for mass. By which he meant he felt it was a religious duty to, to you know, really stick to the rules about dancing. And at the same time, he was breaking a number of rules, you know, like that it has to come from the heart. That, that used to be said, probably still is said. I would be tempted to say it sometimes. But I don't know what it means anymore. And I think Cunningham helped me question a kind of... Uh, interpretation of what comes from the heart might mean uh, as a kind of um, sentimental, uh, soft, um, you know, interpretation. 
maybe. There's a thing that one of your master in Aikido said that you keep, that you used as a score kind of to understand what it was, which was you do Aikido with love. Yes. Um, I was just thinking this is the argument to what I just said before <laughs> is is uh, martial arts because they they work with art, but it is not soft art. It's uh, it just it means fully there. It means completely fully. This Aikido thing, this master told me and demonstrated that Aikido should be done with love. And what it meant was, as the enemy is approaching in that few milliseconds that you have to respond, you lean toward the enemy. You go toward the enemy, so the enemy will be the enemy. You're the enemy. But you come in with love, and you embrace, and you take them. Yeah. Very nice faking of uh, <laughs> Aikido. <laughs> so that's that's the theory, and the the opposite of that would be <laughs> he's he's got me my weight going away. If I'm going toward him, my way is aligned, and I can then it's it's all it's like snooker. It's like pool. You know, it's the, the the way the bodies meet and interact, and uh, and with love happens to be described the winning uh, well, strategy. It's not meant that you have to love them. It's <laughs> meant <laughs> that if well, if celery is the winning spice in the stew, then stew must be made with celery. <laughs> Not with <from> celery. <laughs> I'm just, I'm listening to, to this traveling and I, I'm seeing you work with with the uh, with the dirt. Dirt. Compost. It's the same. I just was asking, clarifying. <laughs> it's the same. <coughs> the birth, the yeah, yeah. revolution, the uh, inner organization, anarchic coexistence. It's the same. With no management. <laughs> Natural processes. Yeah. Well, dance didn't used to be about natural processes. I think that I raised that quite, I was one person to raise that question. That there are natural, or at least to observe that there are natural processes that we are and have and do that are in us and of us and with us and they're natural. <coughs> and dance didn't, dance, I think, I think it's one of many art forms. Anyway, it, when I, when I encountered dance, I think the attitude was artificial, was the highest, I'm not sure, it's not low, I mean it's clearly something high, and being the kind of artificial that they had in those days as a dance ideal. Um, It eliminated lots of possibilities. So there was this thing of, of a reduced reduction of means. So what we all have as people, to become a dancer in those days, you had to stop doing some of them. You know, like, uh, to and, and enable others. So there was this uh, trade-off 
process going on where you traded off your habits to learn new forms. I guess they were new habits, you could say, by after a while. You know, you, a little bit of brainwashing, and, and you kind of start to get new affect. And then a little bit more brainwashing, and a little bit more practice, and you start to become successful in that form. <laughs> And then a choreographer of that form might ask you to be in a dance that used that form, and then you're, you know, on your way. But it is all kind of circular, you know. If the choreographer wasn't already using that form, then they wouldn't want dancers in that form, then <laughs> nobody would be teaching that form, and then that form wouldn't exist, you know. It would break, come back down to ordinary people just doing habitual things. You want some more okay, chocolate? No. <laughs> you? I want to have some chocolate. You can have some more chocolate. <laughs> Bad girl. Repeat <laughs> that. <laughs> Do you want to rest? Perhaps, no? Mm -hmm. You all right? Uh, Maybe I should drink, have a drink. <laughs> a water? There's also tea. Yeah, I know. Tea or I think it's your That water is for you, yeah. <laughs> I am I'm indebted to the world for You want tea or that water? No, this is fine. Want a glass? Nope. And if there is, what is that line for you? Because sometimes Would it be useful to have a line? Hmm? Would it be useful to have a line? Mm -hmm. I don't mean that. I'm just, I, I kind of been witnessing this, this, this debate a lot. And I would... And, and when, I, when I'm... When it's happening, I always wonder, what would Steve say? What you know, the, about well, this conceptual of, oh, that's not I think it's clear well, that is I think not. it's clear that only 17 people in 1971 know what it is. And everybody else is guessing. <laughs> and the reason we know what it is is because we went through the exercise of making it and exploring it. And it wasn't any one of us. I was a, the oldest one, and I was I gathered people to do the work, but I knew that they were the only ones who could define the work. That in their reflexes and in their muscularity and in their senses, that's where the work was. And later I found out about this mother-baby thing and saw that the work exists in all of us at some point in our lives. And I guess what, the form would go mother-baby bond and intimate and, and privileged and uh, microscopic uh, physical communication and gesture, uh, 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 contact improvisation as I would say. That's, that, that is the contact improvisation, the one that starts in the womb between two entities. With the in the womb. The baby and the mother feeling the mother's movement and moving itself. They move inside and if there's two babies in the womb I mean it doesn't get much contact with you. Yeah. But um, um then when the baby's born, it continues. The communication, that intimate communication doesn't stop just because they've come outside the mother. Mm. And so this man, Daniel Stern, revealed by high-speed film that a level of communication was going on between the mother and the baby, physical communication, too fast for us to observe. I had not thought that vision had speed. 
but this proved that it, vision does have a top speed. You, you can't see something that's going faster than a certain speed. Or something, you can only see things that are going slower than a certain speed. Let me put it that way. You might, I don't know, you might see blurs, you might see glimpses of things that are going faster, but you can't follow them. And that's what Daniel Stern found in, in his films, was this dance between a mother and a baby, every mother and every baby. And sometimes the dances were positive on both sides, and sometimes they were negative. You know, babies didn't like their mother. So there would be that kind of dance, a dance of looking away, you know, not reacting, and trying to get out of the, mo the mother's arms. And depressing as that sounds, you know, it, it is. And, and I guess it would resolve in some kind of family life. The other one was much more positive, where they take a kind of pleasure, or anyway, they're relating to each other all the time. And anyway, it's going on at an incredible speed of tiny little movement um, um, initiatives and, and uh, relationships, you know. So, That's what I think I stumbled onto at a certain point, and it had to do with a dance I had with a guy named Douglas Dunn. I'm still dancing. He was in he was in Grand Union, and we had a dance where neither one of us took the lead, and. I could feel in him and he could feel in me that we were both following. And it resulted in something. That's The minute you say that, it sounds as though it's so neutral that nothing would happen. But something definitely happens, and that's the thing that I named contact improvisation. That's something that comes when the contact is there and when you're both improvising and you're following. So whatever people are arguing about, ask them, does it follow, does it fit that direction? Is neither, neither person follow, uh, leading? Is, is, is something happening? Um, is it... Uh, you know, does it dance? Does it do something? <laughs> Seems to me like it's that simple. I, I would definitely not like to be in the position of telling everybody what it is or not. <coughs> it's, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think it's that hard. You know, to discern. I think it goes back to that mother baby bond. I think it always go, also goes back to something that you said before that you, we are somehow we are attracted to not conform, not conforming. But somehow I think we are also afraid of anarchy. Well, I, I think I, I got into this, the cunning of story because I was. Wanted to illustrate how happy I was conforming to somebody else's yeah. dance company. I was happy in that role. Yeah. And uh, I guess this might uh, uh, create all these conflicts. Mm. Mm. But we don't want to, to conform. Mm. So we position is the way that tells people how to do this. But then somehow we want to. So it's like this uh, limbo. Uh, wanted to grasp it, I don't know. Wanted to grasp it, wanted to, uh, to be in the box. But it's easy to. Yeah. yeah. It's not an action. Yeah, yeah. I don't know.
we're such a contradictory species. <laughs> you know, almost anything you say can be proven not to be true. <laughs> so, you know, oh no, we're too smart for ourselves. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I've been talking a lot. Uh, yeah. But what's like the natural process that most like fascinates you and that you connect mostly to what dance is or should be or you feel that it's for you? Ask again, just uh, a little bit louder. Uh, like what's the natural process? Like natural the, process. Yeah, yeah. But you relate more to your dance or what interests you in dance? <laughs> It was uh, a long, slow <coughs> series of revelations that came. Uh, maybe the first one was getting trained and becoming artificial. Myself made me ask, what was I leaving behind that I didn't even notice I was before I started training? So then that was a question. Then I started asking myself, okay, I'm concentrating on movement all the time, in class, in rehearsal, you know, four or five hours a day. I'm really focusing on my movement and how it, you know, where, where it's going, especially if it's somebody else's movement, so I have to know what it is before I even try to do it, you know? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy being in a company. But anyway, then realizing that I stepped outside that room and I stopped thinking about my body. And I thought, what's going on when I'm not thinking? What's my body doing? You know, it's taking me around the city. You know, it's doing things, but Sometimes I think I want it to go upstairs, but I don't actually watch it take me upstairs. You know, that kind of thing. So then I started looking at myself, trying to catch myself doing natural things. This means that I artificialize myself <laughs> so that um, I, I was never able to observe myself doing natural things. <laughs> like, you know, because I was always watching. I was the witness for my own stuff. Uh, you know, I, and, and so therefore, I, it would never be as natural as it was before I started observing. <laughs> and then uh, I got past that, because after a while I just gave up and I just didn't care. And, Pretty soon I got so I, my, my body would let me observe a little bit, you know, and, and keep doing what it was doing. That was an interesting stage. Doing Tai Chi, I had, after a while, a revelation about the front and the back of my body. That I could tell, I mean, you all know this, I'm sure, but... <laughs> When you lean forward, the back of your body has to tense to keep you from crumbling. When you lean backwards, the front of your body has to tense. In that little moment where you shift, there's this incredible sensation of nothing quite holding you up. Everything being ready to shift into action, to stop the problem which would be falling. And through that, I started getting a sense of uh, front and backness. You can feel it happening, soft, hard, soft, hardening, hardening. Then you start doing it in movement, you know. Yeah. Back muscles while you walk. Anyway, playing that kind of observation game, the, the front and the back started really to be uh, an important element. It's in the sense of it's moving through. It starts there, yeah. 
Well, not you can do it either moving or just holding. And that means the front and the back uh, in the movement of front and backness or in the image? Back, the front. <laughs> front. <laughs> yeah, but I see the back swing. Front. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But, so it works on one side, it works on both sides, so it becomes finally a more complex element. Works, uh, you can do it top and bottom. It, it ends up being a technical hmm, what, foundation. So that was one. Another one was just gravity. Obviously, I was thinking about gravity and all of this. Working with Tai Chi, you're working with gravity. But gravity, when I started the first, I remember sometime in the early 60s, realizing that I could relax my arms. <laughs> you know, like I was in my 20s before I realized that you could relax <laughs> my arms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the movement would still happen. At the end of the Cunningham tour in Tokyo, uh, <coughs> I was taking class, and I had been sick for about four months at that point. Some ailment that I picked up in my chest, and I was feeling weak. And I realized I could do all the movements without stressing so much, without you know, doing the movements. You know, I could still do all the shapes. Oh boy, what a relief that was. <laughs> so, I mean, these things, this was my habit. Obviously my habit was to hold and to tense. To just, that was the way I felt myself to be a mover and to be alive. And I suddenly realized I didn't have to be that person. I was still me without being that person who was tense and who was holding up against gravity. So these are the kinds of things, natural processes, and they add up eventually to, um, well, you obviously get rid of a lot of your self-inhibitions. I don't know what yours might be. I assume you have some. Maybe not. Yes. <laughs> he has. In particular, he has. He is he's the only one in the room. <laughs> <In the divisions. laughs> but I mean, it's part of what we are. You know, it's part of who we are that you you have inhibitions that maybe you don't need to be inhibiting. And I think it's very delicate to get rid of them. It's like a, a self exorcism has to be done right, but there are ways that it does happen. I mean, for me, it, I didn't do anything right, I just happened to be constantly fiddling around with movement, and the right things came along. That was a great question. <laughs> Something we should all, all talk about much more than we do. Is it time to go home? Is it time to go home? Is it time to go home? <laughs> this could be home. This could be home? <laughs> you have a bed. <laughs> yeah, it's time to... For us, it's all right. But... Now it's all right. the day no. go. Everybody knows the song. <laughs> Life is growing high? No. Ah. Night. Night is growing high. Do you, do you know what night is? Media? It's the beginning of night. <laughs> <laughs> 
going nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, what does it mean? Oh, it means immediate. Mm-hmm. Nice. Something is nice. Yeah. Very sweet. <laughs> Lullaby. <laughs> Did you all to see? <laughs> we have these scary lullabies. Oh yeah? You have scary lullabies? They show that the monster gets off the roof. Oh my god, really? And they go like... <laughs> <laughs> I have one, one last question. Hmm? What, 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 you, what, what, what would you say to someone that tells you that they feel that they don't have enough contact skills to go to a gym? Ah. <laughs> what would you tell them? Why would they think that? Have idea. they been told that by somebody at the gym? Uh, a lot of people say that. Uh, that I feel that I don't have enough. How would somebody in that position gain more contact skills if they didn't go to jams? <laughs> Maybe the people who are saying that you have to have a certain level of contact skill should explain themselves exactly what they mean and how much they have if they, they are at the jam. And are they talking about, what are they talking about? Are they talking about high athletic events that happen sometimes in contact? Competition, yeah. I don't competition. know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. They just, the people that say. Well, I just think they should be very, much more explicit. And I, I also, I mean, the idea, why can't a little jam of no particular contact skill be going off in the corner? And maybe in the center, these high-flying, athletic, you know, yeah. run and jump games can go on. I mean, I think they both are part of it, but I definitely don't see anything is gained by. I can see if it's a class, and if you want to deal with, you know, and and you're a teacher, and you're going to deal with certain areas of contact. In a, in a brief time, and you want to just work with those, then you could say, you know, medium mm-hmm. contact experience required to join this class. But I don't see it for a jam. Because I, it seems to me like the idea of a jam, the idea of a jam is the place where the best contactor, whoever that might be, dances with the worst contactor, and there's this infusion of the inarticulateness being brought to somebody who's very art, highly articulate and, and conditioned and an understanding between them and this inarticulate person getting to actually feel the resources and reflexes of somebody who's much you know has, has, has had more experience or just has more physicality. I think the reason I became a dancer was to finish my physicality, you know, secretly. But what I was after was I just wanted to keep growing physically. And I didn't feel like the culture encouraged that. The culture puts you in a chair when you're, you know, six years old and keeps you there all through the most interesting growing years. And then, yeah, when you're, it's about 15, 18 years later, lets you out, and you you have not had a complete physical experience. Or sensorial experience. And that channeling is, of course, necessary for the kind of cultures that we put together. But before our kind of culture came along, there were other cultures. And they didn't put it together that way. So, yeah, conforming. I didn't, I was not a successful student. 
I was successful in terms of grades. I was not enlisted into school or academics or... And so later, I was told that I didn't have enough uh, academic experience to join certain groups. I, I don't know. I, the other answer to that question is start a new jam. <laughs> <laughs> Just let the old jam do what it wants to do and start a new jam where uh, only people with no experience can come or something. You know, only, only people with minimal experience <laughs> are welcome. <laughs> what do you think are the differences, or if they are, between movement and dancing? If I think dancing have... is where you think you know what you're doing. <laughs> and movement is where you don't think about it very much. <laughs> Dancing is where, where people make rules about what dance is and what dance isn't. And movement is where nobody has figured out what it is and nobody cares. As long as you're calling it movement, it doesn't matter what you do. There are good reasons why dancing is so formal. which has to do with what people are invested in, who are dancers and who have put in, you know, 20 years of their lives becoming dancers and making choreography and getting on a stage. Oh, God. <laughs> See the difference in our gestures? I hear, I hear that. You hear it, yeah. But <laughs> I'm, I mean... Well, I am an example, and I, in fact, all of my friends who are in their 80s are examples of people who did not buy that somebody else knew what dance was. They decided to make up their own idea of what dance was. <coughs> And I don't think they know anything about movement. <laughs> Dance is more graspable because it's smaller. And it has to, because it has to be defined. I, I don't know how you're defining it, but I assume if you're going to think of your movement as being dance movement, somehow you're going to define it and you're going to refine it and maybe, you know, maybe make some rules. All the dances, all the popular dances I know have rules. Even, you know, like rock dancing, you know. It ends up having rules because it's not doing all the things that all the other forms are doing. So it's separate people, you know, hips, uh, arms, uh, playing with the beat in a certain way. It, it, it becomes an improvisation that very quickly gets Formalized. You can see the form. Anyway, that's what we do. We categorize and analyze, and that's all we need. A little, few categories and a little analysis, and we're off and running. <laughs> Can I ask you something before you go? Because you mentioned rules and that rule, uh, dance, dance is mostly uh, have some sort of rules. And in contact improvisation community, many times there is this sense that there are no rules. But you feel you are seeing rules also in the space uh, unfolding or taking place. What is your perspective on that? Like, you feel there are rules in at least how you project to be, um, or, or you think that any rule would be like a um, distortion of the form of its essence or something? People who say there are no rules 
are simplifying something. They're, they're trying to make a case for, well, think of what the rules were in the dances before, or think of what the rules are in the tango. You do not have a tango unless you have certain circumstances. Those kinds of circumstances don't apply to contact improvisation, which is another kind of touch dance. So, if you were to compare them, or if you had only thought about the tango as a dance, and this other form was movement, then you would say that has no rules. Just to, just to define two kinds of formality. But this is rule-based touching, taking weight, not leaving. Uh, these are all rules. Um, addressing your partner's needs, you know, if they don't know what they're doing, then you help them with what they're doing. Um, if, uh, if you don't know your partner well, maybe you dance more um, strategically, more politely than you would with a really good friend. Those are all rules. I think there's lots of rules in any social situation. I think it really is just simple, you know. Are, are we um, helping each other? Something that simple, that basic. If you're a person with not enough contact skills, who, who is helped by refusing you to a jam? Does the jam think that it is going to go someplace that it need, doesn't need this weight of slower moving, shy people who don't, you know? I worked some with um, Alito Alessi, the guy who runs Brighton Bush Jam. He runs something called Danceability, and he works with disabled people. And through him, I've met a lot of people who are disabled, including one guy named uh, Emery Blackwell, who's a disabled dancer. He's got cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. He can't feed himself. But uh, he's a dancer. In other words, he can, be, he can manipulate himself through a choreography and go touring around and performing with Alito. So I was with him. Alito was on one side and I was on the other. We were supporting Emery. There was some really good and intense rock music on. And we were all just contacting, but within contacting also this rhythmic thing was happening. And at a certain point I got a sense of Emery's nervous system. Now you know cerebral palsy uh, makes people tense up. So they make, if you frighten them, for instance, they'll, they'll you know, they just, their nerves put out way too much energy for, you know, maybe somebody saying boo or, you know, something quietly behind us. So he had to, he said, he had to think about his movements uh, a few seconds ahead of time in order for them not to be over-exaggerated. That is, if he wanted to go to this pencil, you know, he had to get everything ready, and then otherwise he might go, you know, in, in, in his gesture. So inside that nervous system, I could feel in that dance, that kind of thing, the kind of outside armor, of, of uh, thought or uh, uh, inhibition. Inside that was what would would have been like a much wilder and, and more jagged kind of energy. 
inside that, he was bopping to the music. So I could feel like through layers of movement impulse into an inner core. And I assume we all have this. We have to assume that this isn't just somebody with cerebral palsy, but it's in somebody with cerebral palsy that it's gotten so defined that you can feel it. Uh, That was really a stunning moment to feel. It was intimate. He knew when I felt it. He looked at me and he smiled. He knew that I had touched something very deep inside his other movement events. And I had gotten there by doing podcasts. I was following his energy, you know, and I had finally found this place which was more central than I had felt with him before. So that's something he would be excluded from the gem. And that's an experience that, that those jammers who are excluding people aren't going to have. Because they have developed the skills of sensing that could lead them to find something new in a beginning and develop it. Make that person feel acknowledged. So, I mean, in, in a way, that's the stakes.